it's my honor today to welcome everybody to this webinar, this presentation where you'll hear two world-renowned experts addressing the daunting challenges we face regarding the loss of biodiversity that sustains life on this planet. But you'll also be hearing solutions to these problems with organic and regenerative land management practices from agriculture to your backyards. I've been on the board of directors of Beyond Pesticides since 2006, and last year became the president of the board. My day job also involves the environment, including pesticides. I'm a lawyer with Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility, or PEER for short, and we work with government employees at all levels of government who are seeing problems in how their agencies are implementing environmental laws and programs, including involving pesticides. So as an example, a while back, we worked on a series of cases to get uh, genetically modified Roundup Ready crops and neonicotinoids off our national wildlife refuges. More recently, uh, in a campaign uh, opposing mosquito aerial spraying in Massachusetts, we discovered that the pesticides that are used for mosquito spray also contain PFAS, as if they weren't bad enough all on their own. And PFAS is a chemical best known as the Teflon chemical, but it's actually a family of thousands of chemicals that are used for myriad uses and are highly toxic, highly persistent, and mobile in the environment. And so these pesticides uh, were being sprayed from the air across large acreages. And in addition to all the other harm that pesticides do, PFAS was getting into uh, the land and the water. So uh, clearly there is no shortage of problems that we need to address, but there are also solutions. And you'll be hearing some of those in today's talk. Now I am pleased to introduce Jay Feldman, the Executive Director of Beyond Pesticides, who will introduce the program. Thank you so much, Paula. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the 40th National Pesticide Forum, Forging a Future with Nature. I'm Jay Feldman, as Paula said, Executive Director of Beyond Pesticides. This is the first in a three-part series of the National Forum in 2023. As we search deep within ourselves and ask what we can do to move the existential challenges or to meet the existential challenges of our time, the crises of chronic public health diseases, biodiversity collapse, and the climate emergency, we see solutions in thinking and acting holistically in sync with nature. In this respect, we learn from nature. Nature functions with complex interactions, relationships that are multidimensional. In nature, adversity is overcome by balance. We know that birds cannot live without insects. Pollinators do not exist without nectar and flowering plants. And many food crops do not produce without pollinators or productivity suffers. Nutrients in soil are not cycled without healthy organisms. These interrelationships are interdependencies that are easily disrupted. And yet the human approach seems to be to identify target organisms that we identify as unwanted or pests. The pesticide product label identifies target pests without consideration of whole ecosystems in which they live. The ecosystems in which they and we exist. So instead of looking at what in the ecosystem contributes to an imbalance, we focus on disrupting the target pest and in so doing create secondary pest, pest resistance, eliminating food for other species, contaminating soil and water and disrupting aquatic and soil food webs. After causing disruption with this target pest approach, the decline in insects, the insect apocalypse, the now mass extinction of species, the loss of birds, monarchs and bees, the human response is to find the worst toxic culprit. So we seek to ban or restrict the neonicotinoid insecticides and have so that have so clearly disrupted bee and pollinator populations, contaminated waterways, caused human health effects. We seek to eliminate some of the pesticides that cause reproductive harm, 
birth defects in children and sterility. You know, Rachel Carson is most closely associated with banning of DDT. In fact, Ms. Carson, a marine biologist, first and foremost, educated us on the complexity of critical biological systems and implored us to consider that right behind the DDT and organochlorine threat were the organophosphates, you know, chlorpyrifos, which we spent over three decades fighting. A student of history would certainly conclude that our approach, however righteous, has failed to meet the challenge. Whether pesticide reduction strategies, adoption of somewhat nebulous sustainable practices, remember Monsanto advertising sustainable agriculture, the green revolution, integrated pest management, and now regenerative, all without clear definitions and an enforcement mechanism that recognize the complex interrelationships that make up ecosystems. When we cut through all the disruption we've caused for over 70 years, the effect of endocrine disruptors, defying classical dose makes the poison toxicology, understanding epigenetic and multi-generational effects, impacts on the gut biome and the relationship to disease, synergistic effects of multiple chemical exposures. We have a choice for future action. Do we continue to manipulate data with huge uncertainties, arbitrary margins of safety, risk assessment and mitigation measures that establish chemical restrictions and benchmarks, that's EPA's language, and accept unrealistic assumptions of exposure with no attention to pre-existing diseases or vulnerabilities? Or do we adopt a fundamental change with a precautionary approach that advances non-toxic practices as a fundamental change um, based on community, state, national, and international mandates. The good news, the latter is already happening at the community, farm, and gardening level. The question now is how we, as individuals, organizations, elected officials, institutions in our communities, envision stepping back from the ban the worst chemical campaign and campaign to embrace a transition to holistic certified organic land management practices. In our work, we point to EPA's review process, its inability to really control where pesticides move through air and into water, food, and soil, and parks, schools, and playing fields. We point to the effects of low-level exposure dependency on petrochemicals and the damage they do to soil health reducing nature's ability to draw down atmospheric carbon. We show disproportionate harm to people of color and those like farm workers and landscapers experiencing occupational exposure. Then we point to the fact that we can improve our quality of life, enhance productivity and resiliency, increase profitability, and better protect against insect-borne diseases with clearly defined regenerative organic systems that eliminate petrochemical pesticides and fertilizers. How we manage our land and respect relationships with nature is key to meeting the existential challenges of our day, supporting changes in practices and policies that embrace nature. On the issue of expense, it is not the case that regenerative organic is ultimately more expensive from a management standpoint. More importantly, studies consistently document that the cost of petrochemical use externalities, morbidity and healthcare, loss pollination, water contamination, and now the cost of floods, fires, mudslides, and storms must be factored in for more realistic accounting. Yes, we must make a cultural and policy shift. It is already happening. We are at this forum because we want solutions that are meaningful, we recognize the urgency of the moment, and we want to forge ahead in the communities where we live, work, and learn. The clarity and urgency of our conversation and strategy in communities have come into exquisite focus to protect ecosystems, and in so doing, protect the environment that supports life. Today's two speakers, David Goulson, PhD, and Andre Liu, Doctor of Science are extraordinary, both preeminent leaders in their fields of study, teaching, and writing. After both speakers' presentations, we will have time for questions and answers. 
Please enter your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom toolbar or by clicking on the three dots at the bottom right of your screen. We begin today with Dr. Goulson, who provides us with the clarity of his scientific work and the effectiveness of his writing in bringing us the truth through science. Dr. Goulson, an entomologist, professor, researcher, and author, empowers action through knowledge and science. His most recent extraordinary poignant book, Silent Earth, is a critique that inspires action because the catastrophic path, which he so eloquently lays out in his, in his book, compels us to act. Dr. Goulson is a professor of biology at the University of Sussex in Great Britain, the founder of the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, a fellow of the Royal Entomological Society, a trustee of Pesticide Action Network UK, an ambassador for the UK Wildlife Trust, and author of more than 300 scientific articles on ecology and conservation of insects. As a scientist, Dr. Goulson has brought his voice to the policy arena, exemplifying the best in scientific advocacy. He has shared his knowledge with grassroots leaders in Europe, the United States, and throughout the world, and we thank him for that. I know if we were in a huge hall introducing Dr. Goulson, he would receive a long standing ovation, but alas, he is only today here, hearing me singing his praises and appreciation for his work and voice. Dr. Goulson, thank you again for being here. We appreciate everything you're doing. Thank you, Jay. I, I'm now embarrassed that I have to live up to those words. Uh, do bear with me a second. I'm just going to share my screen. This is the critical moment that I hope works smoothly. Nearly there. Let's go full screen. Marvellous. I hope now you can see a picture of a rather handsome bumblebee there. Uh, so I, I'm going to talk to you, uh, I was going to say this evening, it's this evening where I am, um, about insects, uh, which I've been fascinated by all my life. Um, ever since I was a little kid, um, I, I uh, for some reason, was just drawn to these little creatures. Um, but actually, I think many kids are. This is not me. This is my um, my youngest son, Seth, with his pet cockchafer, Colin. And uh, uh, sadly, Colin's no longer with us. But uh, uh, but Seth still is still very much in his insect phase, and uh, I hope he never grows out of it. Um, but I do find it rather sad that actually, you know, most people by the time they're teenagers or adults are frightened of insects. Their reaction, if anything, flies near them is usually to flap around and and try and kill it. They think it's going to sting them, bite them, give them a disease. I don't know why. Um, it's totally irrational um, uh, and very sad because insects are amazing creatures um anyway so the, this negative attitude to insects is it's rather nicely captured i think by this sign uh i came across this picture it, the sign was on uh, the university of south wales in in the uk uh, this was about a year ago um middle of middle of summer actually a bit uh, more than a year ago and uh there's this huge so the top half is in welsh if you're wondering what on earth that's that's about the bottom half obviously translated warning flying insects in this area uh, as if to suggest that flying insects are something that we should be terrified of run for your life there's some flying insects about absolutely nuts um in in actual fact all that all that was warning about was some flying ants um we have no ant species in the uk that are remotely uh, harmful or even really like to bite or sting um, so uh, why the need for this huge sign, I don't know. But anyway, uh, I just find it rather sad that we have such a negative attitude to these amazing and vitally important creatures. For me, I mean, in insects are, are, are wonderful. Um, uh, they are amongst the oldest creatures on Earth. They've been around. Uh, the first insects appeared about 480 million years ago, um, which is twice as long ago as the oldest dinosaurs. Um, it's really way, way back in the beginning of life on Earth. 
And because they've been here for so long, they've had time to, to speciate uh, into, well, we know we've named so far about 1.1 million different types of, of insect. Um, but what's really mind boggling and fascinating is that it's estimated that there may be another five or 10 million that we haven't yet discovered. So the bulk of life on, a, on, on our planet, we have yet to describe, um, which, which, is, which is kind of exciting and wonderful, but also rather sad um, because some, if we're not careful, many of those insects will disappear before we even ever see them. Um, because insects rather sadly are in decline, as I'm, I'm sure you're aware, all biodiversity globally is, is, is in decline. Um, I'm just gonna give you a, a handful of examples. I don't want to dwell too much on this aspect um, because it's kind of depressing and I'm sure you don't need convincing that there's a problem. Uh, one of the most striking data sets on insect decline um, came from Germany uh, where German insect enthusiasts have been running what are called malaise traps. That's a picture of one top right there, uh, which are kind of tent-like traps that catch all types of flying insect. And what this odd looking chart shows you is the, the, the biomass of insects caught per trap per day. Um, and these, were, these traps were placed all across Germany from the late 1980s onwards. Uh, and between 1989 and 2017, um, the, the average catch fell by uh, 76%. So seemingly three quarters of the flying insects disappeared from, from across Germany in you know 26 years, really not that long a period. Uh, and what's perhaps even more scary is those declines didn't start in 1989, almost certainly. Um, and are still continuing. Um, so this is just a kind of snapshot of part of a much bigger decline. We don't know what proportion of insects have already gone um, in terms of abundance of individuals. Let me just show you a couple of other sad examples. Um, this, this is uh, a, a type of bumblebee. We call it the shrill carder. It's a European bumblebee. Um, bumblebees are my speciality. I've spent the last 30 years uh, studying uh, bumblebees, gorgeous little creatures and very important pollinators. Anyway, the, the, the map um, uh, of the UK with the red dots shows you where this species used to be found um, in the first half of, of the 20th century up to 1960. But as time has gone on, this bee has been disappearing rather rapidly. Um, by, by the year 2000, it was down to about six kind of surviving populations in the UK um, and that actually the 2000 was the year I first saw one of these bees I went looking for them uh, and went to a place called Salisbury Plain um, which is the now got a green ring around it um, and I spent the summer hunting around for these rare bees and and I got really excited when I finally found one uh, but sadly that population has now gone um, and the one to, to the west on the Somerset levels seems to be about to disappear. Um, so so this, this bee has gone from being a common insect um, 60 years ago to, to an insect that could go extinct in Britain pretty within a handful of years on, on its current trajectory. It's, this is happening right now on our watch in our lifetimes. And for some bees, for some bumblebees, it's too late uh, moving to your side of the pond. Uh, this is Franklin's bumblebee. Um, it's, it's now uh, sadly almost certainly globally extinct. Uh, it's native to Northern California and Southern Oregon, um, but it hasn't been seen since 2006, despite the intensive efforts to to find it. Um, the reason I'm showing you one with a pin through it is, is simply because it went extinct just about the time when digital cameras were becoming popular. And uh, so there are no actual good pictures of, of a live specimen, um, only very blurry ones. Um, so you're left with this rather poignant remains of a, anyway, it uh, makes me sad. Franklin's bumblebee is gone forever. Uh, anyway, whether you, I, most people probably don't care too much about insects disappearing, as I've said, um, 
Uh, most people don't like insects, it seems to me. Um, but they, they, whether they love them or loathe them, we all should be worried by this decline because insects are really important to everybody. Um, and I can't put it any better than than E.O. Wilson put it. You may have come across this quote before. Um, I won't read the whole thing out. But he basically said that if people were to disappear from the planet, uh, it would do very nicely without us and quickly recover uh, uh, to, a, as he, he put it, a rich state of equilibrium. But if the insects were to vanish, essentially the environment would, would collapse um, because insects are vital. I've already mentioned how speciose they were. I didn't mention that, that they make up about 70% of all known species. Um, so they are the bulk of biodiversity on our planet. Um, but they're also important in, in lots of ways to other organisms. So, for example, their food, of course. For a huge number um, of birds, reptiles, amphibians, freshwater fish, bats, all of them eat insects. Uh, so if the insects go, then then so does much of the rest of life on our on our planet. They're not just important, of course, as food. They're, uh, they perform many other, uh, what are sometimes described as ecosystem services, things like helping to control crop pests in a way that doesn't require pesticides, um, recycling waste materials like dung. Uh, by, there's a dung beetle top right there. Or dead bodies. Uh, that orange and black beetle is a... Is a uh, a type of beetle that helps to to dispose of uh, the corpses of small animals and they help to keep the soil healthy they distribute seeds and nearly all of this kind of stuff goes on without really anyone appreciating it or paying it the slightest bit of attention most people have no idea that these things are happening apart from a few crazy entomologists like myself um, the one thing actually that people do appreciate about insects now which is a step forward is that they're vitally important as pollinators. Um, th this is, the bees in particular have, have had good PR in recent decades and have gone from creatures most people knew nothing about to, to creatures that are, are widely loved because everybody understands that the bee does something vital. It pollinates flowers and ensures that, that they set fruit, um, uh, which of course is important to, to us humans. Actually, the reality is it isn't just bees that do that. Um, there's a whole swathe of a huge diversity of different insect species, thousands and thousands of species involved in pollination, including butterflies and moths and lots of species of fly and wasps and beetles and, and so on and so on. But between them, they pollinate 80% of all the plant species on our planet. So if we didn't have these pollinators then then the large majority of plant species would set no seed and would ultimately disappear which of course would be completely catastrophic for all all life um, and from a directly um, selfish kind of human perspective about 75 percent uh, i'm sure you've heard these figures before about 75 percent of the um the crops that we grow um wouldn't give a good harvest uh, without insect pollinators. Um, so uh, we'd have far fewer apples, cherries, strawberries, um, uh, uh, blueberries, tomatoes, chili peppers, pumpkins, even things like um, coffee and chocolate depend upon insect pollinators. Imagine a world without those. Um, wouldn't be worth living. Uh, and uh, seriously, it's we couldn't feed the world a, a nutritious diet uh, without insect pollinators. So, so we have a very direct selfish interest in caring for these little creatures. We really need to avoid ending up like these folk. Um, these are pictures taken from southwest China where... Um, uh, it's there's a huge area of apple and pear orchards and it's become um, standard practice now for the farmers and their children to hand pollinate the trees um, simply because there are very few pollinators left not enough to pollinate the trees so the farmers have to do it themselves um, 
this is a high value crop and in a country where labor is pretty cheap so it's economically viable for 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 human bees um to to do the work of real bees but imagine a a, a farmer in in the developed world having to hand pollinate his field of canola or whatever it um, it's not going to happen um so we need to make sure that we don't end up in this situation now i've trotted this argument out many many times that the insects are vitally important to us that we will be worse off without them um and it's absolutely true but i, I it leaves me slightly dissatisfied and I've started to wonder whether it's the best argument to always be using for two reasons, really. Um, one is that it's not really why I care about insects and, and nature and, uh, and all these amazing creatures that live on our planet. I don't care about them because I'm worried about where my next cup of coffee is coming from. I, I care about them because I think they're cool. They're beautiful. They're amazing. They're interesting. Um, and, and they deserve, it seems to me, to live, whether they do something useful or not. Which brings me to my second concern with that argument, which is that there are lots of insects that probably don't do anything vitally important for us. And does that mean that we can just let them go extinct, that we don't have to worry about them? Um, and just, just to give you a, a, a very obscure example, um, you can see here, the St. Helena giant earwig. Uh, this is the biggest earwig species that ever, ever lived. They're about seven centimeters long. So it's a whopper of an earwig. Um, only found, as you might guess from the name, on St. Helena, which is a little island in the, in the Atlantic. Um, used to live in seabird colonies, scavenging. Sadly, it's extinct. Um, it hasn't been seen since the 1960s. Um, now, it wasn't doing anything useful that we needed it to do. It went extinct. There were no repercussions. The seabirds didn't all suddenly die because the earwig wasn't doing something. Um, it made no difference so far as we can tell. Um, but it seems to me, well, two things. that The, the world is a, is a sadder place without a giant earwig, even if none of us were ever going to see one of these creatures. And as I've already said, surely this creature deserved to live um, alongside all the other creatures on our planet. Most species of insect have been here for millions of years. Um, what right do we have to come along and wipe them out? You may wonder how we wiped out the earwigs on St. Helena. It was simply because we introduced, accidentally introduced rats, um, which presumably found a, a seven centimeter earwig to be a tasty snack. Anyway, so if we're gonna, solve these insect declines, reverse them ideally. Uh, we need to understand what's driving them. Insect declines are actually being driven by lots of different factors, um, which I'm not going to talk about today, but things like loss of habitat, impacts of non-native diseases, fertilizers, light pollution, climate change is starting to impact. But my real interest in recent years has been on, on pesticides. Um, now, of course, I, uh, Jay already mentioned Rachel Carson. It's 61 years since she published Silent Spring and kind of woke the world up um, to the, the perils of industrial agriculture and the insecticides and other pesticides that we were liberally sprinkling on our, on our land. Um, and, and she succeeded in, in a sense. Um, uh, her work resulted ultimately in, in the banning of many pesticides. But I think she'd be really sad to see where we are today if she was still alive. Of course, she she died actually not long after publication of Silent Spring. Um, because we've become ever more reliant rather than less reliant on pesticides since her, since her day. Um, just to give you one example, I mean, in, when she published Silent Spring, there were about 37 different pesticides available to farmers in the United States. Uh, today, that number is closer to a thousand different products that are available to farmers. So it, I, I guess many people don't really question this sort of industrial approach to farming, not just the pesticide use, but the huge monocultures, the heavy fertilizer inputs. 
Um, I think many people think that it's just a necessary evil that we've we need to industrial farming to feed everybody, that we need all these chemical inputs um, to, to grow enough food to feed the, the growing human population. Um, of course, there's 8 billion of us. There's going to be 10 billion of us before too long. Um, don't we need this approach to food production? Well, you'll perhaps not be surprised to hear me say I, I don't think actually um, we do. And, and in fact, more um, importantly, I think if we carry on down this route, we will starve because it's not sustainable. Um, not just because of the pesticides, but for many other reasons. Well, th particularly three reasons. Um, as I've attempted to capture with these three images. So firstly, um, this industrial approach to farming is the biggest driver of the loss of, of biodiversity from our planet. Um, uh, the switch to ever more intensive monocultures pretty much makes the land hostile to, to all life but the, but the crop. And so you're replacing... Well, I've seen top left there, replacing rainforests with oil, oil, oil palm plantations. That entails a massive loss of biodiversity. But as we've already seen, farming depends upon biodiversity. It depends upon pollinators to pollinate the crops and creatures to keep the soil healthy um, and insects to control the pests and so on. So in that sense, farming in, in this in this intensive way is undermining its own foundations. Then in a very similar way, of course, um, on the right there, um, farming is doing terrible damage to our soils. Um, the uh, United Nations published a report quite recently which estimated that 40% of the world's soils are now badly degraded. It takes tens of thousands of years to replace soil. So, um, you know, what are our children and our grandchildren going to grow their food in if we carry on down this route? Uh, and then, of course, bottom left, the polar bears are there to, to remind us all of the, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions associated with industrialised farming, particularly the fertiliser use, actually. Um, but we all know that we need urgently to tackle climate change. Um, well, food production and processing and transport and all the rest of it contributes about 30% of all of our greenhouse gas emissions. That's huge. Uh, and we simply can't carry on doing that. So we, I don't think we can carry on down this route. We need a, we need a better way. And in particular, um, well, hopefully we'll hear more about the better ways from Andre in, in 20 minutes or so, uh, but hopefully we can find a way that doesn't, uh, that reduces our dependence or ideally eliminates our dependence on pesticides. Now, as I mentioned, um, things have been getting worse rather than better. It's, it's hard to get figures on global use of pesticides, but pretty much every estimate suggests that they increase year on year. And we may, in fact, it says 3 million tonnes uh, of pesticide are used per year globally. Some estimates suggest that's as high as 4 million tonnes, but it goes up every year relentlessly. Um, we're becoming more reliant on pesticides rather than less. Um, as I say, Rachel Carson would be would be sad. Um, this shows a, a classic tractor spray of pesticide from a boom, but of course they're also applied from the air. Not so much in Europe, thankfully, but uh, um, uh, sometimes in North America, as you know, um, aerial sprays have been applied to control mosquitoes, to control grasshoppers. Um, and this is incredibly indiscriminate. Um, spraying a, a toxin from the air like this is going to kill billions of individual organisms of thousands of species, not just the one that the farmer wants to kill. In the developing world, pesticide use is very poorly regulated. Uh, the equipment and training is often awful. Um, uh, this picture I took in uh, Bangladesh not Bangladesh, in, quite close to Bangladesh, in northeast India, at uh, the edge of Calcutta, um, a couple of years ago. Um, this farmer's spraying paraquat weed killer. Um, you can see he's using some kind of ancient pump sprayer um, and attached to the pesticide is in that old tank that's hanging off his hip. Um, he hasn't even got shoes on, um, let alone gloves, breathing mask or anything else. And he's spraying paraquat, which we banned in Europe 
uh, many years ago, still used, I believe, in the United States. Um, it's banned in Europe because it's incredibly toxic to people. Um, you only have to drink a drop or two and it'll kill you. Um, the, 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 there's real hypocrisy here, though, because we still manufacture paraquat in Europe. Um, most of it's made in, in Britain, in a town called Huddersfield. Um, so it's too dangerous for us to use, but we're more than happy to, to make thousands of gallons of it and sell it um, into countries like India, where guys like this using old equipment and without any training in the use of these harmful chemicals are spraying them around. Um, pretty terrifying. Anyway, back closer to home for me, um, I mentioned that pesticide use is increasing. This is just one example. It's quite hard to get hold of this kind of these kind of data, um, but this chart here shows you um, pesticide applications to what we call oilseed rape, and I believe is is usually called canola on your side of the Atlantic. Um, from 1988 up to nearly close to the present. Um, so the, the bars indicate the, the average number of sprays per year um, carried out by the farmers for four different classes of pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, molluscicides. And you can see that it's, it's increased. It's actually increased um, about threefold. So three times as many sprays being applied per field per year uh, now as there were in 1988. Um, and all classes of pesticide have increased, not just herbicides or whatever. Um, all of them, as you can see, have gone up if you scan from left to right. Um, and I think what's really worrying here is this hasn't been associated with any increase in crop yield or any known outbreak of particular pest problems. Um, so here I'm just putting up yields of, of the major crops grown in Western Europe. Um, now crop yields, they, they fluctuate due to the weather very much. Um, uh, rainfall is the biggest driver from year to year. But the overall pattern is that, is that yields are flatlining. Um, so th this doesn't quite match in terms of the, the, the years shown the, doesn't quite match the previous chart. But the point I'm trying to make, perhaps clumsily, is that farmers are applying three times as many pesticides to, for no measurable benefit at all in terms of yield. Uh, something you, and that cannot carry on. If they carry on spraying more and more and more, eventually, aside from the environmental devastation, they'll be spending more on the pesticides than the crop is, is worth. And it raises a really interesting question as to why they're spraying more and more. Um, I suspect much of it is simply marketing pressure rather than an actual need. Let me let me dwell for a little while and talk about a, a case study, the case study of, of the neonicotinoids, which Jay mentioned earlier, uh, which I think uh, it's, it's quite interesting. And it's a, an area that I've been particularly involved in, in terms of research. You've all heard of neonicotinoids, I'm sure. Um, it'd be hard not to if you're at all interested in pesticides and their impacts on the environment. Um, but bear with me while I give you just a kind of brief introduction to their to their use. Um, there are different types of neonicotinoid, but they're all um, synthetic variants of nicotine, uh, which is obviously a naturally occurring uh, toxin in, in um, tobacco plants that protects them against insect predators. We've tweaked that molecule to make these uh, new molecules, things like clothianidin, thiamethoxin, imidacloprid, and so on. Uh, so they're neurotoxins. They attack the, 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 the neural system of insects. They're um, most commonly used as a seed dressing. So top right shows you some um, canola seeds covered in, in uh uh, an neonicotinoid and a, a dye is added there, which makes them that rather strange bright blue color, which tells the farmer that they've been treated so he doesn't mix them up with untreated seeds. Uh, they are used in lots of other ways, but but seed dressings is the most common use. Um, and it, it it's become very popular because it's very convenient for the farmer. He buys the seed pre-coated pre and he just has to sow the seed in the ground. He doesn't have to spray anything. 
and the pesticide is absorbed by uh, the the idea is that the pesticide coating dissolves in the damp soil and the little seedling as it grows the young crop sucks up the pesticide it's systemic it spreads to all parts of the plant and makes the plant toxic to insect herbivores really neat system and, and that's why it's proved so popular uh, neonix were first came on the market globally in 1994. Imidacloprid was the first one that farmers could get their hands on. Um, but this chart just shows you the, the, how the, the, the amount of them changed from their introduction onwards uh, in, in the UK. Farmers really liked them because they were so convenient. They didn't have to do anything to, to apply them. Unfortunately, or well, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your point of view, one of the properties of, of neonicotinoids is that they are phenomenally toxic. They, um, the, the toxicity of pesticides is usually measured by a thing called an LD50, that stands for the lethal dose that kills 50% of, of individual creatures. And the standard test insect is the honeybee there. Um, now, on the top left, I've just put up the LD50, so the lethal dose for imidacloprid and then three other um, pesticides, which you may have heard of. You've certainly heard of DDT at the bottom there. So the smaller the dose required to, to kill 50% of the creatures, uh, the more toxic the chemical and you can see straight away that the imidacloprid, the neonicotinoid, is much, much more toxic than other insecticides that went before. Um, it takes just four nanograms, four billionths um, of, a, of, a, of a gram to kill a bee, compared to DDT, which is about 7,000 times less poisonous to a honeybee than this new generation of insecticide. You can't visualize four nanograms. It's kind of hard to, to, to get your head around. Um, but if, if I've done my maths correctly, that means that um, a teaspoon of uh, imidacloprid would be enough to kill one and a quarter billion honeybees. Um, so the fact that we're applying hundreds of tons of these chemicals to the landscape is, is quite concerning, uh, but more so because it turns out that this system of applying them to seeds is not quite as clever as we thought. Um, so this diagram is meant to show the environmental fate of neonicotinoids when applied as a seed dressing. So floating in the air in the middle is a dressed seed, which the farmer sows in the ground. The little bit of dust created during the sowing process, and a little so that coating, a little bit of it comes off about 1% and blows around in the air. So you've got toxic dust. And there've been a number of studies that showed if a bee happens to fly by the tractor when it's spraying, uh, when, sorry, when it's drilling a, a treated crop, the bee will almost certainly die almost immediately. Anyway, that's a trivial problem in the grand scheme. Um, so I mentioned that the seed goes in the ground, the, the seed coating dissolves, and what's supposed to happen is that the, the little crop sucks up the pesticide, which it does, but it turns out it only sucks up a little bit of it. On average, about 5% gets taken up by the crop, which is where you want it to go. Most of it is staying in the soil, uh, these compounds are water soluble, so they dissolve in the soil water uh, and they can leach downhill into streams and rivers. Or just as they're supposed to be taken up by the roots of the crop, um, they can be taken up by the roots of any other plant that happens to have roots in the edge of the field. For example, wildflowers that the farmer might encourage along the field margin or hedgerow plants that may grow along the edges of fields. They also uh, suck up these potent insecticides and become toxic to wildlife. Just to give you an example of how devastating the leaching into water can be, um, this is a, this is a, a study from Japan, um, which uh, the, what I'm showing you here is the zooplankton biomass in a place called Lake Shinji, the biggest freshwater lake in Japan. Um, uh, and it, it's it's been carefully monitored. This is the number of, of little invertebrates living in the water, essentially. Um, uh, and the, they started using neonicotinoids in 1993 in Japan, um, in the surrounding rice paddies. 
um, which drain into the lake and you can you can see what happened it, essentially there, there was a, a a huge collapse of zooplankton which led to a massive collapse of the fish populations and and basically destroyed a quite substantial fishery based in this lake neonics are used all over the world and um the scale of our pollution of the global environment is is rather nicely if depressingly illustrated by this map um, this was produced by swiss scientists who did something quite interesting they they got honey samples from all over the world and um uh, screened them for these neonicotinoids um so each little little dot represents a honey sample and the white ones are samples that were clean, didn't contain insecticide. Um, the, the darker the color, the, the higher the concentration. Uh, so remember that these are neurotoxins. They're kind of like knobber for insects. They're incredibly potent um, neurotoxins. And 75% of honey samples from all around the world um, are contaminated with them. Now, that means that honeybees are being poisoned. Most honeybees in the world are being poisoned right now. Um, uh, but of course, it isn't just about honeybees because th this contamination is coming from contaminated nectar of flowers, which, as I said earlier, are visited by thousands and thousands of species. Um, all the wild bees, butterflies, moths, and so on and so on and so on are all being poisoned all over the world. And this is just one of the many insecticides that we use. Um, one of the more problematic ones, perhaps, but uh, I'm sure if those Swiss scientists had screened for other pesticides, they'd have found many more. So actually, in Europe, the, the whole neonicotinoid story has been quite, in a, in a way, quite positive because it's resulted in, in action. So just, just to run through what's happened in Europe, um, we got near in 94, as did the rest of the world, 93, 94. Um, almost immediately, French beekeepers started saying that their bees were dying uh, as a result of these new insecticides. They were ignored for quite a while, um, but eventually scientific evidence started to accumulate, um, including from labs like my own. Um, it became clear that they were harming bees, that they were contaminating rivers, they were contaminating wildflowers. Uh, and so in 2013, the European Union banned their use on flowering crops. Uh, and when it became clear that, they're, that they were contaminating the environment, um, even when used on non-flowering crops, the European Union banned them completely in 2018. I say completely, that's not absolutely true, but I won't go into the details. But uh, more so... It's actually quite a nice example of, of governments responding to scientific evidence uh, and doing the right thing, I think. Uh, of course, the rest of the world has ignored all of this evidence and continues to use neonicotinoids. But this does bring me to, to a key point, which echo, and I just want to echo what Jay said in the introduction, that, um, that although it makes sense to campaign for the banning of the worst pesticides. Um, clearly, that isn't the ultimate answer. Um, it, it is, um, to steal a phrase that Jay used when I was chatting to him the other day, it's like playing whack-a-mole. If you look at, at the last 60 years, we've repeatedly campaigned for banning a particular pesticide. But as soon as we do, and it usually takes decades to get there, um, it's replaced by another one. And the pesticide industry are constantly developing new ones. They know that, that some of their products are going to be uh, banned at some point, and they plan accordingly. And they obviously they delay as best they can. They string the whole process out. But when eventually the pesticide is banned, they've got another one to take its place. And we don't get anywhere. We're just going round and round in a kind of like a crazy pesticide merry-go-round. Um, we need to find a better way. Um, so what are the better ways? Well, um, the big picture, as I've already alluded, I think, is that we need to, to change the way we farm fundamentally. Um, I'm a big fan of organic farming. Of course, there are many other um, options in the regenerative farming world um, that you may or may not agree with. Um, and it's quite an interesting area, which Andre, no doubt, will tell us more about. 
Um, what I'm going to just finish for the last 10 minutes of my talk uh, talking about is what we can do in urban areas, uh, which is something more of us can get involved in. You know, most of us aren't farmers, um, uh, but we many of us have some sort of garden. Uh, we have a bit of our own space where we can do something positive if we so choose. Um, uh, and I, I think this is a really exciting area. It's something I'm a big fan of. I, I have my own wildlife garden that I try to attract as many creatures to as I can uh, and I think if we could persuade enough people to do this it would make a real difference there are a lot of gardens uh, in the UK about 22 million private gardens um, I, and uh, my sort of crazy dream is is that they're all full of wildflowers and pesticide free and, and so on um, I try to encourage it by writing books about these kind of things should you be remotely interested um, and it, it you may be surprised by how biodiverse a garden can can be. Um, there's a really nice um, uh, example from the city of Leicester in northern England, where there's this a lady called Jenny Owen, who had quite a small garden, it's about an eighth of an acre, um, quite near the city centre of Leicester, which is not a, a particularly um, a city. It's not a city famed for its biodiversity, shall we say? Um, anyway, she spent 35 years identifying everything she could find in her uh, garden that she she encouraged wildlife in. Uh, every insect, every bird, every plant species, every uh, spider species. And her species list from uh, her little garden um, after 35 years of looking uh, was 2,673. Isn't that, I think that's amazing. I mean, that's the sort of number I might've expected from a, a little patch of rainforest, not a, not a garden. So we can all have thousands of species in our garden if we if we look after it the right way. So so what is the right way? Well, uh, rather sadly, uh, while there is a big movement towards um, encouraging wildlife in in gardens, um, there's also it seems to me a, a, a section of society going in the opposite direction. Um, uh, there was a recent survey showing that um, eight percent of gardens in the UK now have plastic lawns. How depressing is that? What Doesn't that just, it, for me, it's a bit like that red sign I showed you at the beginning. It reflects this complete kind of disconnect from the natural world. I could rant on at length about why we shouldn't have plastic lawns, but I'll I'll spare you that. Um, you can even buy that, that in the front of that shot there. That's a plastic hedge. Now, I've no idea whether you can buy plastic hedges in the United States. I guess you probably can. Um, but how tragic is that? Um, anyway, um, and, and look at this, sorry, one final, just just slightly amuse me in a depressing kind of way. The irony of this, you can now buy plastic lawn cleaner, uh, which promises to make your plastic grass smell like a, a, a wildflower meadow, freshly mowed lawn fragrance. I, I, how, I, I don't know where to start, really. Um, uh, meadow fresh, it says, your, your plus, anyway. I, I hope you haven't got plastic lawns. Um, another aspect of, of management of urban areas, of course, which is, is relevant to talk is, is the use of pesticides. Um, uh, while some of us are trying to encourage wildlife, others uh, use quite a lot of pesticides in urban areas. They're also used by local councils, um, somewhat in, indiscriminately. Uh, this scorching of this yellowing of vegetation that you can see here is classic um, uh, herbicide use, probably glyphosate, Roundup, um, it's by far the most commonly used pesticide in, in urban areas. Um, it seems I never really understand why, why we think this is this is necessary. If you look top right there, you know, what harm was that little patch of vegetation doing? Um, it, it was supporting a little bit of life. It was green. There was maybe a flower or two. Um, now it's dead. Was that really necessary? Um, so it, it seems like a sort of unnecessary violent environmental vandalism in the name of just tidiness, um, which we could do without, I think. Um, uh, and there's, of course, there's a there's a there's a darker side to this beyond the impact on on biodiversity, which is that um, glyphosate is a very controversial chemical. You've all heard, I'm sure, about the. The, the evidence that it's probably a carcinogen uh, has been linked to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The evidence is debated, and of course, Monsanto, uh, the manufacturers dispute it. 
Um, but do we really want to spray it on the children's play equipment in our parks? It just seems completely bonkers to me. Um, I, I personally am a big advocate of simply banning pesticide use in urban areas. I know the United States is not, not big on banning things. Um, neither, it must be said, is the UK. But to give you some heart, if you're interested in, in pushing for this kind of thing in your local community, France has banned um, pesticide use in urban areas completely. Um, did so in 2018. They introduced a law that essentially only licensed farmers can now buy pesticides, which means the local council, the local authority can't buy pesticides to spray in parks and gardeners can't buy them to spray in their in their gardens. The French have managed perfectly well for the last five years. Their cities, yeah, I've been to Paris recently, it wasn't overrun with weeds and cockroaches or anything else. Uh, it hadn't seemed to have changed at all. Uh, it's perfectly possible to, to, to not use. Why would we want to spray poison in the places where our children play, where we grow fruits and vegetables and, and where we, we live? It seems completely nuts to me. And in fact, um, uh, I, I, I've mentioned I'm a keen gardener myself. I grow lots of uh, veg in my garden uh, and I simply find I have no need for insecticides at all um, because my garden is full of wildlife. It's, it, and if I, if I do get a, a pest outbreak on my vegetable crops, I just leave it. And it's amazing how quickly this whole army of natural enemies um, come charging over the horizon to, to, to come to my rescue and eat all the aphids or whatever the problem is. Um, and if you don't believe me, you can see it on YouTube. Uh, I made a little five minute video why you don't need pesticides in your garden, which just shows my the, the uh, runner beans, which every year get attacked by black bean aphids. And every year I do absolutely nothing about it. And a whole army of um, insects and predatory birds come and eat all the aphids. And I always get a whopping crop of vegetables without needing to use any pesticides at all or do anything. Um, I just wish people, more people knew that. Before I wrap up, I'm nearly finished, I promise, and I'm getting close to time. A couple of other things. It may be that you, you garden without pesticides yourself already. I suspect many of you might do. But do beware, uh, when you go to the garden centre, all those beautiful plants on sale, and some of them are badged up as being bee-friendly or perfect for pollinators or whatever it might be, um, they're all chock full of pesticides unless you find an organic nursery, um, which are few and far between. I know this because we tested them recently myself um, uh, from, from the UK, and I'm sure it's the same in North America. The, the, these beautiful plants are reared en masse in really intensive facilities where they use tons of pesticides. So if you test these plants, we found 75% of the plants being sold as bee friendly actually contained insecticides in their nectar and pollen. Beware also of flea treatments on dogs and cats, which many people don't think about. Your vet will advise you um, to treat your animal prophylactically against fleas by dripping insecticide onto its neck. Um, the two most popular products are um, these two here. The one on the left is based on imidacloprid, that neonicotinoid that I was talking about earlier. Um, the dose you're supposed to drip on your dog is enough to kill 250 million honeybees. Um, which is not good. Um, the other one is, is based on a product called Fipronil, which is almost as bad. Okay, so I'm, I'm out of time. And uh, let me just, just wrap up by saying, it's worth stopping. We never stop to think, uh, really, do we? That we live on a rock hurtling through space with a little crust of life clinging to its surface. There's us and maybe 10 million other species of creature living with us. It's absolutely extraordinary. It's, it's, it's almost absurd. It's amazing, it's inspiring, it's beautiful. It gives us everything. It's our home, it's our source of, of everything, uh, food, water, clean air and, and inspiration. And it's just bizarre that we are being so reckless with our, with our planet. We need to reconnect with nature. We need to realize we are part of, of nature uh, and stop treading so heavily on our planet and it, it really worries me you know i've got kids um i'm sure many of you have we would do anything for our children wouldn't we apart from it seems leave leave them a decent planet to live on um and we've got to do better and, we, and maybe we can start by looking after all these little creatures that live all around us the insects 
Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, I really want to encourage people to get a copy of Silent Earth because a lot of the complexities that you have really simplified for people, I think would be valuable for local decision makers that you know, may want to do something, but they don't really feel compelled to act. So the book is compelling, um, but it's also instructive on uh, steps that can be taken just as your talk was today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am now going to introduce the next speaker. Um, as you know, uh, Andre Liu, Doctor of Science, is our next speaker. Dr. Liu brings extraordinary passion. We have a lot of passion today to his research, writing, and advocacy that comes from his experience with the soil and management alongside his wife of his fruit farm in Daintree, Australia. He lives and breathes complex biological systems. And, and you know, he translates that into practice. So his academic work translates into practical application. His understanding of the science of ecosystems inspires his deep optimism. We need some of that, that regenerative organic practices are practical and can be adopted worldwide to meet existential challenges of our time. And the good news is that he shares it all with us in his numerous books, including his most recent highly acclaimed Growing Life. As a leader in advancing organic agriculture, Dr. Liu is the international director of Regeneration International with more than 400 partner organizations in 70 countries. Um, these are organizations that span agro agroecology, organic permaculture, ecological agriculture, holistic grazing, biological agriculture, and organic agroforestry. The goal, cultivate an international movement to reverse global warming and end world hunger by facilitating and accelerating the global transition to regenerative agriculture and land management. Andre has served as president of IFOM, Organics International, the international umbrella organization for the organic sector. IFOM has about 850 members in 127 countries. Please rise from your seats, even though we can't see you, and give Dr. Liu a virtual rousing standing ovation. Thank you, Andre, for being with us. Jay, thank you. And I don't know if I can live up up to all of that, so I appreciate it. I'll just start to share my screen and talk about my presentation today. I've called it Regenerating Agriculture, Climate and Biodiversity. As Jay said, um, I'm the International Director of Regeneration International, and he explained what our vision is, which is a healthy global ecosystem. We're talking about regeneration on the larger scale. It's not just about regenerating the soil. We want to regenerate communities, our democracy. Uh, we want to gen regenerate our climate and regenerate public health. And very importantly at the moment, we need to regenerate peace. So. It's a bigger picture of regeneration. We were started in um, 2014 in New York uh, in a climate change meeting that will you know, equivalent of what is happening next week. I just realized I, I need to uh, share my whole screen. Just hold on. So um, we came about from a meeting we were in uh, New York in, in, in the United Nations climate change meeting in the Rodale headquarters. And it was a handful of us, and we were leaders from the organic, agroecology, holistic management, and um, environmental and natural health movements. And we felt that we really needed to be 
build a larger global movement to actually regenerate our planet and our agricultural system and our health. And the initial steering committee was Dr. Vandana Shiva, Ronnie Cummings, the late Ronnie Cummings from Organic Consumers Association, Dr. Hans Heron from the Millennium Institution, and Steve Rye from Macola, and myself at the time, I... I was the international president of iFoam Organics International. And what I want to say is that before 2014, very few people had heard about regenerative agriculture. And we were the people who actually used communication to get this idea out, get this concept out all around the world. And every day it's in the, in the news now. Um, at the moment, we're growing very rapidly. We have over 500 partners in 70 countries on every arable continent. And we are actually the largest and most significant regenerative organization on the planet. And we continue to grow every month. So let's start talking about what is regenerative agriculture. So. Where we came from is that we looked at sustainable, and I think Jay said it beautifully, when Monsanto became the largest sustainable agriculture uh, organization on the planet, that was the day sustainable agriculture meant nothing. Sustainable went nothing. You know, is this the world we want? And sustainable is defined as maintaining resources and the environment without degrading them but we're already in a degraded system. So we need to do more than sustain it. We need to improve it. And the concept of regenerative was to improve our resources. And what was really good about this, when we talked about regenerating agricultural systems, it's a simple meme and consequently it resonated widely. Most farmers get it that agriculture, business as usual, um, has to change, but they're trapped. They don't know how, how to move forward. And by putting in this concept, by regenerating agriculture, we make it accessible. We make it doable. And this is why it's become such a revolution. And one of the things I do want to say is, as a person on the front line who speaks on every continent, this is still mostly a farmer's revolution. There are people trying to hijack it, but I, I want to say that the people really driving this are farmers. I go to farmers' meetings all around the world on every continent. And it's a term, it's an umbrella term being used for longer rotations, cover crops, green manures, legumes, composts, organic fertilizers, and it includes agricultural systems that can regenerate soil organic carbon, soil organic matter, because that is a key proxy for soil health. So let's talk about the definition. I know people say, oh, regenerative hasn't been defined, organic is defined. Um, I'd like to say as someone who's been the longest serving international president, that we have multiple definitions of organic and they don't always agree. Every country has a definition. Most organizations have definitions. We have multiple organic standards and it's a nightmare to try and get them to harmonize. So um, it, it was a real issue for us when we started looking at what is regenerative agriculture and we didn't want to make the mistake that the organic sector made most of us who formed regeneration international were international leaders of the re of the organic sector we wanted to keep regenerative simple and accessible and not be exclusive and start um sort of defining it too narrowly, and then it limits what we can do. 
So by definition, regenerative systems improve the environment, soil, plants, animal welfare, health and communities. But what is really important when we are looking at regenerative is the opposite of regenerative is degenerative. So by definition, agricultural systems that use degenerative practices and inputs that damage the environment, damage soil, health, the genome, communities and animal cruelty, and these include to you know, synthet synthetic toxic pesticides, synthetic water, soluble fertilizers, genetically modified organisms, confined animal feeding operations, exploitive marketing and wage systems, destructive tillage systems, they are not regenerative. And as a result, what we're doing is saying they must be called out as degenerative agriculture to stop greenwashing and hijacking. This is really important. What's happened when you get a, a few corporations like um, Syngenta and others who want to call themselves um, regenerative. So you get people then attacking regenerative. That is not the way to deal with it. The way to, do, to deal with this is to say they are not regenerative because what they are doing is degenerative and they need to be called out as degenerative agriculture. And that is what we are doing to keep the integrity. The, our perspective is that all agriculture should be regenerative and organic, but based on agroecology. Um, so what we're talking about here is that agroecology is a science and a practice, and it's a very good way of underpinning how we bring um, diversity and the science of ecology in agriculture into our farming systems. What we need to do is see regeneration as a way to improve systems and heal our planet. And we want practitioners to be able to determine what practices are acceptable and regenerative and which are degenerative and unacceptable. And for us, there's a very simple way to do it. It's the four principles of organic agriculture. These principles are clear and effective ways to decide what practices are regenerative and what are degenerative. These are the principles. Health. Organic agriculture should sustain and enhance the health of soil, plant, animal, human, and planet as one and indivisible. That's the first one. Ecology. Organic agriculture should be based on living ecological systems, cycles, work, and work with them and emulate them and help sustain them. Fairness. Organic agriculture should build on relationships that ensure fairness in the familiar um, environment and life opportunities. And care. Organic agriculture should be managed in a precautionary and responsible manner to protect the health and well-being of current and future generations and the environment. And the reason we did this is because we have multiple organic standards. We have multiple organic definitions, even multiple words for organic. Organic is only used in the English-speaking world. If you go over to the continent in Europe, the word is bio. In Asia, I'm currently in Taiwan, and actually they, they use their version of bio. Bio means life. And so all through Asia, their words for organic agriculture is life agriculture. So from our point of view, we don't want to get stuck and argue about what is the right word or what is the right um, little criteria within a standard or you know, spend our whole life tweaking definitions by just having these four principles, we can say, if a system um, is based on these principles, we can call it organic. So from our point of view, those systems are also regenerative. It's a very simple, clear way for us to start analyzing all practices. So now I wanna talk about the other side of 
regenerative agriculture and what we're really doing. And it starts with the most important process on this planet, photosynthesis. And this is where solar energy is combined in combines carbon dioxide and water in leaves and it produces glucose. And glucose is the most important molecule of life. And when you look at a plant, 95 to 98% of its biomass comes from water, carbon dioxide, which happens to be the main greenhouse gas, using energy from, um, from the sun, from photosynthesis to make glucose. Less than 5% of a plant's biomass actually comes from soils and minerals. From our point of view, standard agronomy's got things wrong. They concentrate on the 5%, but they ignore the elephant in the room, the 95%. And that's what I want to talk about today. They're managing the 95%. Now, glucose is the basis of nearly all the molecules of life on this planet. So it, um, when plants make glucose, they further synthesize it into more complex sugars, such as uh, you know, sucrose, which is uh, the sugar we put in our, our food, or, um, you know, sorry, a whole range of other sugars. But um, probably the most important sugar they build is called cellulose. And cellulose is, is long chains of glucose put together with water. And that's what wood, leaves, roots of plants, that's the 95% is largely made of these long chains of glucose. But glucose is also changed into carbohydrates, which is the starches that we eat, you know, wheat, flour, potatoes. It gets changed into hydrocarbons, which are, are the oils that we use and the fats in our food. And, and by the way, the fossil um, oils, that, that we use for um, feeding our motor cars. That's all come from fossilized um, photosynthesis. And then it get, if you add a bit of nitrogen or a little sometimes sulfur, we can turn glucose into amino acids, which are the basis of our DNA, our proteins, our hormones. And all these other carbon compounds come from glucose as this basic molecule. What is really important in this process is that when a plant grows between 10 to 40 percent, um, I like to say an average of 30 percent of the carbon compounds that are uh, created through photosynthesis are secreted through the plant's roots to feed the soil microbiome. And there's various words for it. Um, you know, Christine Jones will call it the Car, liquid carbon pathway, Dr. Elaine Ingham, for instance, calls it the carbon gift. And this is an example of these exudates. You can see them coming out of a root tip. And these feed the most biodiverse part of our planet, the rhizosphere. It's a complex, interconnected, biodiverse ecosystem of uh, microorganisms. This is an example here. It's around the rhizosphere where soils form. And here, for instance, you can see this is a um, hi-fi of a beneficial fungi. We'll talk a little bit more about them. But also here, there's, there's millions of organisms, actually billions, that build soil. And what you're seeing here, these um, crumbs here, they're called PEDs. That's what we call a soil structure. It gets built out from the roots by the biology that is fed from the organic compounds made from glucose. That is the basis of biodiversity on our planet. Very importantly, that these, what we know now too, is that when um, plants grow, they grow with or in a natural ecosystem, they grow with symbiotic organisms, particularly symbiotic fungi. And this little pine tree is an example of what we're talking about um, 
this this is where it's photosynthesizing. It's feeding the glucose, and these are the areas of exchange where it ex exchanges the glucose to the fungi. Now, what the fungi is doing, it is um, extending the roots by miles and miles of this little seedling and getting nutrients like phosphorus, like nitrogen, also bringing water deep up in exchange for the glucose. The fungi can't photosynthesize, so it needs glucose. And in most of nature, this is the way the world works. It's called symbiosis. They are helping each other, and it, it's synergetic, synergistic. In other words, instead of one and one equaling two, you can equal three, four, the benefit is greater. And in fact, over time, the benefit increases because um, the more the nutrients that the fungi feeds its host plant, the more it grows, the more it grows, the more glucose it makes to make organic compounds to feed the fungi. So it's in their interest to benefit each other. The other really important thing here is that we know now that these fungi are actually not just connected to one plant, they're connected to other plants, they're connected to other um, fungi, and they exchange nutrients, they exchange water, they also communicate to plants, help them with protective compounds. It's a whole area of science now where we're looking at these um let's put a, a, a really good way of saying living intelligent systems, complex systems. And we know that pesticides like Roundup and synthetic fertilizers kill these living systems. And uh, instead we have these dead toxic systems. And these are the systems that are the very basis of life. And so what I want to talk about here is this concept of what we call soil health when we're going into farming and how we um, protect plants from pests and diseases. And soil health is the, is the number one um, rule for us in, as organic farmers. I've been farming organically for more than 50 years. And we used to be ridiculed for saying soil health. I can tell you, even 15 years ago, I did a paper in one of the peer-reviewed um, agricultural journals and one of the reviewers um, took me to task for using the word soil health because it was not a scientific term. But I, I'm one of these people who fight my reviewers and I won that. Um, anyway, I want to get back to the principle of health. Organic agriculture should sustain the health and enhance the health of soil, plant, animal, human and planet as one and indivisible. And this is really important. You get soil health right, we can deal with, we, we generally say 80 to 90% of all our problems because most pests and diseases attack opportunistic plants that are stressed. The other thing I wanted to say is where you saw that symbiotic fungi, when you have a healthy um, soil biome and you have that symbiotic fungi, they will protect the plant from being attacked by other fungi, they protect their host. So this is an example, and actually at the top I've got um, where our principle of health came from. And this actually came from Sir Albert Howard, um, one of our pioneers in the 1940s. He learned this in India, and he said, the health of the soil, plant, animal, and, and man are one and indivisible. And that's something that, that it's influenced the way we work this is a, um, a field trial, a scientific field trial. You can see the, the researchers, the scientists is there. And what we, it's wheat being grown. It's the same field, the same soil, the same climatic conditions. Now, the wheat that has been grown with good practice, chemical agriculture using fertilizers, has been attacked by rust and it has to be sprayed with a fungicide otherwise it will not survive you know, um, we call these toxic rescue chemicals they, they, in, in industrial agriculture they have to have them otherwise they, they lose their crops next to it 
um, is wheat growing with compost. And one of the things, very important things to say about compost, it's not just a fertilizer. It's an inoculant of billions of species of microorganisms to, you know, to bring in this robust biodiversity. So if we look at the wheat that's been sprayed, that's used the you know, good practice industrial agriculture, and you can see it's been attacked by the fungi. It um, got only about 1,600 pounds per acre after being sprayed. One of the things I want to say here is this is what most people eat. This is what our diet is. Conventional food is this. And I'll put it at the top because um, how it influenced Rodale. Rodale is the person who um, popularized the word organic in, uh, in the English speaking world, who's the publisher um, in the US. And, and still, you know, if you still have the Rodale Institute, which is to me one of the, the great institutes on our planet. And Rodale as a publisher simplified it. Healthy soil, healthy plants equal healthy people. And when we talk about the opposite, the degenerative, unhealthy soil equals unhealthy plants, which equals unhealthy people. So this is the compost. And, and you know, the really important thing to say here, compost is an inoculant making a complex living neural network. And this one gets 6,500 pounds. It's healthy. This is what we should be eating when we talk about the, the concept of, of healthy soil, healthy food, healthy people. I'm a farmer. I've been farming tropical fruits for years, and, and, and I'm a commercial farmer. I, I produce tons and tons of fruit to send to various markets. So I'm, I'm, I'm not a small-scale farmer. I do it all organically. And this is one of our crops. I live in the tropics, papayas. And it gets attacked by one of our worst bugs called a fruit spotting bug. And for years and years and years, all the farmers fought to keep one of our worst pesticides, one of the last of the organochlorines, endosulfan. And they fought and fought. Australia eventually banned it. We were the second last country. Um, India was the last. Because they said, uh, if, we, if, if we ban endosulfan, this bug will destroy our crops. That's what farmers always say. You know, we, we need these crop protective tools. Uh, if, if you ban it, there's nothing we can do. What I want to show you here is that when I see the attack, I fix up the soil health. And here you can see it's fixed up. You can see the young papayas. And what actually happens here is that plants put out protective compounds when they're healthy. And when I'm, I, I see that the plant is being attacked, I fix up the, the health. And what is really interesting, this particular bug now, it gets totally slowed down. I can go and just pick it off the tree. But what happened in my case, and we'll talk more about it now, I bring in beneficial species. So the little birds and the other um, beneficial insects have no trouble finding this pest and cleaning it up and restoring the ecological balance to my farm. And this is the concept. And I want to really follow on what Dave said in terms of biodiversity. And the word we use is functional biodiversity, bringing um, biodiversity that gives us ecosystem services. This is what agroecology is. And there are refuges of, um, of flowering plants, and we use the word insectaries. And many insects have a range of host plants. And some of our useful species, such as parasitic wasps, hoverflies, lacewings, they have carnivorous larvae that eat the pests, but the adult stages live primarily on nectar and pollen from flowers, in part because nectar and pollen are very rich in sugars and, and, and amino acids, but also um, there's these compounds that are what we call proto hormones that um, they need to reach. They, they they take these to 
build the hormones to reach sexual maturity so they can reproduce. So here we see um, the little wasps feeding on, on these flowers, nectar and pollen, and then uh, as part of reproducing, um, they'll lay their um, eggs on or near the pest, and then the uh, eggs will hatch um, sometimes inside the pest. This is actually where Alien came from in the movie. It's based on these uh, parasitic wasps but, you know, on a larger interstellar scale. But um, what, what I was trying to show you here is that the larvae then feed on the host. Generally speaking, the venom of the wasp is used to actually paralyze the host and just keep it in a state of um, suspended animation as, as a fresh food source for the, their babies when they hatch. Um, these, by the way, the, these animals are also um, very vital pollinators, not just bees. They actually, the, all, all of these um, species have important roles in pollinating. The research has shown that increasing the host plants on farms breeds um, thousands, actually, um, it's really millions of beneficial organisms to control pests. We have a whole range of them, so I just sort of take some of the pictures. You know, in my farm, for instance, a hoverfly. Um, ants are really good. This is one of my favourite species of ants um, that lives in trees. Um, this is an example of the eggs being laid on a paralysed um, caterpillar. Spiders are really good. And, and another one I love are, are frogs. We, this is our largest frog, um, a green tree frog that, that, that gets up to six inches long. It's a, it's a beautiful frog. But I, I, I love them. And, and the thing is, this is if we spray poisons, we lose them. So I, I, you know, we, by not spraying poison, we can let this incredible biodiversity do so much of our work. So this is my farm. And my neighbours are horrified at my farm because, as you can see, I've let all these weeds, instead of having dead brown grass or bare soil, I've let all these weeds get out of control. I actually think it looks very nice. These are, um, a range of them are our native wildflowers, but there's other ones that I've, I've deliberately brought in for their functional biodiversity to provide nectar, pollen and mating sites. And they're also refuges. So this is an example of my farm. And the reason I've, I've taken this is I want to explain exactly what I'm doing because I've, I've put a high contrast here is to show I'm using the sunlight that my cash crop isn't using here. And as the sun travels through the day, this moves. And this is now feeding what we call cover crops or ground covers that – um, as they grow, you know, 30 to 40 percent of what they do goes into the ground to feed the soil microbiome to build fertility. In this case, what I want to show you is that if you look at my place, everywhere you'll see I have flowers. So my place is alive with insects. Everywhere you go, there's insects. And most of them actually, like Dave said, we don't know what most of them do but they feed the biodiversity, they're part of the biodiversity. But I have um, you know, very few pest problems. I, in fact, I, I used to, when I started, before I learned to do this, I used to use organic sprays. I, I lent my sprayer to a neighbour something like 15 years ago, and, uh, well, I've got no need to get it back. Um, I, I don't need to even spray organics. I'm getting the... Um, the biological control. And like I say, I grow tons and my quality is the best. I used to actually export to Japan um, and the Japanese are the most fussy. I could get quality and quantity by bringing in these agroecological systems and into, into my farm. So what I'll, I really want to say here is that, you know, for people say you can't do it well, what they really mean is they don't know how to do it. I am doing it. I'm a commercial farmer and doing tons of high yielding quality crop. And what we're doing here, why I wanted to show you the, the importance of photosynthesis, I'm using solar energy. The solar energy that my cash crop, the one that 
outputs the fruit is not using. Instead of wasting it, I'm using it now to provide multiple ecosystem services into my production system. So it's low cost, it's highly efficient, and very productive. These are examples. I, um, this is in the US. This is a farm I really liked in Wisconsin. And here they're planted in sectaries in rows. This is in Nebraska. And what this organic farmer did, he, you know, these are square mile farms, the big blocks there. And he actually put the, um, um, planted this large border of trees around. There's a windbreak, but it also makes a good insectary. It's actually a barrier to stop pests from coming in. And then um, as part of the rotation have alfalfa. Alfalfa is a really good insectary crop to bring in beneficials into the system. And then this is actually in Michigan, and here's a Michael Field Research Station, and there they're experimenting with all these different types of flowering plants as borders to use um, as insectary. So that there's a lot of work on it. This is Bhutan, and I, I like this because most farms have these marginal areas. Instead of spraying them to kill the weeds, start planting them up with biodiversity. So you have lots of small little plants for the um, pollinators, but bring in little, little trees and bushes for the small birds. The small birds eat an enormous amount of pests, but they need um, shelter from the larger ones that either attack them or bully them. So you build something like this, and then you can actually manage it by using that as stock feed, and they do it as stock feed and then um, then compost the uh, manure and put it out on the system. Here's four very you know, good rules, simple rules. Any flowering plant that attracts bees is suitable as an insectary plant. And the beneficial insects prefer species that are rich in pollen and nectar. The smaller flowers are better for the parasitic wasps because um, the bees... Sometimes, you know, the, the, the honeybees can be bull, big bully girls and they, 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 they will dominate the um, bigger flowers. But these so-called little insignificant weeds, um, um, that is, they're not as um, important to them. So um, they're really good for the parasitic wasps because these parasitic wasps are just a fraction of an inch. They're really small. So what looks like little insignificant weeds flowering, leave them. They are absolutely brilliant for bringing them in. The greater the diversity of species, the more effective it is. So the more you bring into it, instead of spraying it out and you know, nuking the system, anything that's not your cash crop you know, is a weed, so you've got to nuke it, spray it out, plow it out. It's the other way around. The more we bring in, the more resilience we bring into the system. And the other one is the taller support more. You know, it's a bit like high rises. You can feel a lot more people um, in Manhattan than you know you can in um, a farm in upstate New York. You know, it's simply because you you're stacking people vert vertically. It's the same when we make insectaries. The taller we can make them, the more we can have in them. So some of the simple ways of making insectaries. This is called strip mowing. I I, I learnt this in California. And here you see that instead of mowing, um, they're looking at it, this is a field of alfalfa. Instead of just mowing it in one go, if you, if you mow it in strips and you leave refuges, you increase the amount of beneficials. So you can see in terms of spiders, the bugs, the, the wasps, you know, they're substantially more if we mow in strips. One of the things I want to say here is, look at this, 1976, we've known this for 50 years. Well, it's been out there for 50 years. No one knows about it. But when I learned this, this is I changed my management on my farm. So um, just to show you, this is actually a month ago on my farm. I took this where I let what the neighbours think of the weeds get out of control. These are flowering plants. It's full of beneficials. And this is one of my tropical fruits um, called lychee, lychee. And... When it flowers, that's the time it gets attacked by the pests. So what, what I do is I leave this, and just as it starts flowering, I mow this down in strips. 
So I drive the beneficials out of these flowers into these flowers so they will control it. If you go to my farm, it's not nice and neat. There's always these refuges, these strips I leave for um, of flowering plants that, um, you know, that are refuges. And you can see here, I mow in stages. So um, if I mow, but before I mow this down, I will allow another area to grow up as a refuge. Now, many of these are our weeds. And our weeds, our local weeds, already have local beneficial insects. They're the hosts of local beneficial insects. You know, stop thinking of weeds as a problem. Start thinking of them as an asset. It's not about nuking them and killing them. It's about how we properly manage them to increase the biodiversity that we want in our systems. And this is the key to my management system. There's lots of ways of doing it. You know, this is a very simple way. This is Myanmar wheat. Just grow a, a good border of sunflowers. Um, yellow is very good for attracting um, both pests and beneficials. Um, but so what happens when the pest goes in here, there's also the beneficials. They clean them up before they go into the wheat. Um, the other advantage for these farmers, we see the size of this stake, they get a crop of sunflowers and a crop of wheat, and um, they've trapped all the, in, the pests for the going in. We call these trap crops. So the last one I just want to say is that, um, you know, especially when people are first starting out to go into an ecological system, it takes a time for the ecology to work. And you'll, you know, you'll need some sort of, you may need some sort of spray program. We've always said in the organic sector that spraying pesticides and fungicides should be regarded as the tools of last resort, not first resort. What I put here is that in most cases, you can just use non-toxic sprays. Most vegetable oils and um, flour and water, so vegetables we, we, um, flat, that will mix with water, there's, there's a range of them. Flour and water works is, is a very good um, non-toxic spray, mild soap, clay and water. The, the way they work is that insects have breathing pores and they um, suffocate the breathing pores. So it's a bit like drowning them. They work very effectively. They're not poisonous. We just use edible vegetable oils. I don't think anyone's going to die of a, um, res a bit of residue of flour and water on their food or, or you know, coming in contact with a bit of mild soap. It doesn't seem to kill people too much. And, and coming in contact with clay and water, you know, really, in most cases, that's all you need. Um, then I, I, I'm not here to give you a whole lecture of it. I, I do teach farmers there's natural minerals. We have botanical pesticides, biological, and they all have their roles. But the, the one thing I want to put across, and this comes out of the IPM industry, is we never cover spray, as this will kill all the beneficials, and that includes flour and water, you know, vegetable oils. Um, they're indiscriminate. And so... Even as an organic farmer, you use it and you spray everything, you kill all, your, all the good guys, you've got nothing to control the bad guys, and you lock farmers into endless losing spray battles. So what we um, talk about is what we call hot, hot spot spray. We monitor areas for the highest concentration of pests. Pests aren't evenly distributed through a field. They're in... Um, you know, some parts with lots and some parts with hardly any. And those areas with lots we'll call hot sprays. Just spray them because um, by leaving the rest of the area alone, that means you don't kill the beneficials. They will control the rest. And we ensure a healthy population of beneficials. The other thing that it's really important to explain is that in an ecological system, we need a certain amount of pests. We don't want to kill them all. We kill all the pests. What do the beneficials eat? What do the beneficials live on? We need pests. It's just getting what we call the threshold right. Just because you Five see minutes. a pest. Okay. Thank you, Jay. Um, 
go on to the next part now. And what we're doing now to finish, um, to scale this up, is we're setting up what we call regenerative organic carbon ecosystem services. And with that, we aim to fix the climate, regenerate agricultural and indigenous managed ecosystems, and eliminate rural poverty. And what we want to do is base this on payments to farmers, traditional owners, and land, own, land managers for conserving and regenerating biodiversity, also carbon dioxide renewal, uh, renewal from above ground biodiversity and soil um, organic carbon. We also, very important, improving gender equity, fairness in labor, production and marketing, and empowering the next generation of land managers. We um, want to grow regenerative organic and pay farmers for it. And we're putting certified organic and also PGS organic as the basis of this project. And we're insisting as organic as the entry point, the baseline. We want to bring in what we call best practice, agroecological and regenerative managing uh, methods um, on top of this base, baseline. And we want to end the myth of low yielding organic systems because um, we, we can bring in high yielding systems. And we want to produce a range of eco services such as increasing agri and native biodiversity, carbon dioxide removal, and you know, reductions in greenhouse gases, stopping soil erosion, synthetic chemicals polluting the environment and human health. We will have no joining costs for participants and we will pay the initial certification, what we call measuring, reporting and verification fees during the transition period. We provide free training in best practice regenerative, organic, and agroecological, and also training in how to increase above ground and um, um, soil carbon. We, we call this true climate change justice. It, it's based on the polluter pays principle and pays the person for fixing up. So what we want to do is work with good corporations and organisations um, to get the funds under their ESG programs. There's billions of dollars already being spent, or we would actually say misspent. Now, we're not doing carbon offsetting. This is really important. We're talking about a fee for service. We're paying farmers, landholders, for the services they are doing in regenerating the climate by taking down the excess greenhouse gases and regenerating our biodiversity. They're not tradable commodities or financial ecosystem derivatives. And landholders will own their carbon and ecosystem assets. They're not selling it. The, the, that's the reason why we want to use organic, because at the moment there's a lot of greenwashing and lack of credibility. And for us, um, every country has an organic certification system. And we can use the oldest and most credible one as the baseline to ensure the credibility. Then on top of that, we've got our own measuring, um, reporting and verification. So this is a way to end greenwashing in, in this system. We will not certify organic systems such as confined animal feeding operations, synthetic feed supplements, hydroponic soilless systems, damaging tillage and unhealthy organic junk food products. Don't forget we've got a, a um, you know, principle of health and having organic junk food goes against that very principle. You can't have an unhealthy organic product by definition. And the same in um, regenerative and agro agroecological systems. Any ones that use GMO, synthetic chemical fertilizers and pesticides will not be certified under our system. And we actually see this as a way of resolving the criticisms of organic agroecology and regenerative by combining the best practices of them. It'll be a huge system to drive change. I've talked with a lot of people why they don't want to go organic and certification frightens them. If we helped them through it and paid them, yes, they would do it. So this will be a way for us to grow regenerative, organic and agroecology. We've already started two pilot projects. One is in Oaxaca um, in Mexico with organic shade growing coffee from uh, indigenous you know, First Nations um, farmers. 
and we have another one with selected biodynamic uh, products. And we're using this um, to inset the value of these ecosystem services so the funds directly go to the farmers. And what I want to end on is this, in terms of the type of world we want. If we look at you know, degenerative agriculture, and, well, it actually starts with what Dave showed, the clearing of forests. 80% of the forests being cleared at the moment is for industrial agriculture. These monocultures that are sprayed with toxic pesticides, this is a war on nature and killing everything. And the result of that, it goes to another war on nature. It goes into these cruel, confined animal feeding operations that should not exist. This is, this is just an absolutely terrible system that is producing toxic food to feed. And this is the one I really want to end up on, um, an example of when we talk about regeneration, and this is the Savory Ranch in Zimbabwe. In 2006, this is what it was, bare ground overgrazer, had 200 cattle on it. Those 200 cattle, the way it was managed, was doing um, incredible ecological damage. And this, unfortunately, is the case with so many of the um, rangelands on our planet at the moment. Now, people say, oh, we've got to get rid of it, um, get rid of the 200 cattle. What Alan did instead is bring in, um, based on the way herbivores work in nature, brought in an agroecological system of managing by rotating them the same way they move in the wild from the pressure of predators and move them and didn't bring them back until um, the actual ecosystem had recovered, until, until the ground cover had recovered and then put them on again. So by 2009, you can see the difference. Now, this is a picture I took here uh, this year in, in, in January, I was there. And I just w want to say, I've got no cattle in this picture. Is it, there's actually now instead of 200 cattle doing damage, there's 400 cattle there, but they are a long way away from here. Um, they will be brought to here eventually. Instead of being crowded in the confined animal feeding operation, they are, you know, um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of yards away and they will eventually come to this as beautiful fresh ground oh, and this is what's called adaptive multi um, paddock grazing the it's re, not only regenerated this incredible diversity of grasses you can see the native wildlife all the trees have gone back so at the moment they've doubled the stocking capacity in fact, they've got so much grass, they're about to bring in another 200 cattle, so they have 600. They have a herd of elephants. I don't know if you can see it. That's actually an elephant hide for them to watch their elephants. And there's all these other wildlife species. You know, when I was there, there were gazelles and impalas and baboons and, and you know, the number of native species in, in, in this um, savannah ecosystem was just phenomenal. The other thing I want to say is these systems, and that's another talk for another day, we sequester more greenhouse gases than we emit. These, these sort of systems scaled up could actually make our planet greenhouse gas negative. And, and, and this, this is a really important issue as well. But in the end, I suppose where I want to end is this. It's not either or, or you know, if we, if we get rid of pesticides, we, we will starve. It's the other way around. We can start regenerating our degraded, degenerated ecosystems. We can double, triple our, our production, plus have all the extra biodiversity. It's not, oh, we've got to get rid of the um, elephants and because and, they're competing, you know, or, or the impalas, that they're eating grass. No, we can, we can have our native biodiversity back and get more production. That is what we are doing and this is what we need to scale up and we do this we can regenerate our planet so thank you thank you thank you andre um i think the juxtaposition of your talk um with david dave's talk is really helpful 
And we've gotten a lot of really good questions. I also want to, um, uh, as I did for Dave, I really want to encourage people to get your book, uh, the most recent one, Growing Life. I think it's critical reading um, to follow on everything you've said today and sort of have the background and the, the tools we need to be effective advocates. So <clears throat> when we met in our pre-meeting, and maybe we can bring Dave and um, you can stay on the, on the screen there and bring Dave back on. I know it's getting late there. Um, we, um, Dave asked uh, us who the audience was for this um, session. And um, I basically said that we're, as, as you surmised and incorporated into your talk, Dave, um, a lot of people are sympathetic to the issues already. Uh, different degrees of knowledge and background on the actual science. <clears throat> but all folks, um, and many of the folks we work with, most of the folks, really want to see change that starts from the bottom up. I mean, people are working in their communities. So your reference to what's going on in France, Dave, and um, the specific uh, gardener in Leicester, um, I think really helps to really exemplify what can happen from the ground up. Um, obviously in the United States, we have um, some really dysfunctional po politics. We can't even get a farm bill through the current Congress. And so our most a lot of what goes on around policy issues at the national and some of that re is replicated at the state level um is very disheartening because we can't address national problems that really do need national attention um one of the questions we got i think sort of exemplifies um the challenges that we see given the lack of a national understanding that we need to really transition away from this dependency that you you mentioned and its adverse effects and, um, you know, we we talk about different levels of intervention by regulatory agencies that can address uh, these issues. You mentioned the neonicotinoids, um, which we all know to be systemic chemicals that are, as you mentioned, in seed treatment, uh, then move through the vascular system of the plant and get expressed through gutation droplets, nectar, and pollen. Um, we have seen regulatory efforts in the US, both at the EPA level, but also at the local and state level to restrict the use of these materials. And one of the, one of the most favorite strategies for mitigating risk to pollinators is to restrict application. Um, now they're talking about application. So that would be drenching of a chemical or spraying of a chemical. They're talking about limiting it to the times when pollinators are foraging or moving through the fields. And I'm wondering, given your knowledge of these chemicals, their persistence, someone asked about half-life, um, their residuals that remain in the environment, and in, in many cases, breakdown products of these chemicals or even inert ingredients. I don't know if you ever touch on that. What, what is this concept of um, restricting use patterns to when insects are foraging or pollinating? I mean, I know that's those are different things, but pollinating in the fields. How effective is that? Yeah, so presumably the 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 aim the idea is to restrict their use so that they're applied when insects aren't foraging. That's I mean that's that's been a common practice for many decades with any insecticide. If you spray it when pollinators are on the wing or actively visiting flowers, you're going to kill them. Right. Um, so the, so for some pesticides, um, the non-systemic ones that can help if you spray them for example at night or at late in the evening when when bees have all gone to bed you'll reduce the damage um, but with systemic pesticides that permeate the plant 
then they'll be in the neck to the next morning. It makes no difference when you spray them because they're, they're they and they're also they're quite persistent, so they're around for a long time after they're sprayed. Um, it can be months or years. Um, and once they're in the plant, if it's a flowering plant, they're there to stay. Um, uh, so the, the the pollinators, as soon as they drink the nectar or eat the pollen, they'll be poisoned and they'll be poisoned chronically every day and uh, ultimately be likely to die. So it's it's a nonsense, um, essentially, to, to, to claim that that is a, a mitigation strategy. Yeah. Um, and this is, as you say, this has been a... a sort of an operating principle that's applied to regulatory mitigation measures for decades. And yet it seems to, the, the arguments see, that you just made seems to fall on deaf ears to regulators. It's sort of a knee jerk response to, well, we got to do something and let's, let's, you know, maybe this will have some effect in a positive direction. Uh, yeah, if I other... could just, sorry, Jay, if I could just add something. Uh, the, the, the data on uh, Nenix in honey um, included many samples from around the, the United States. Uh, that shows unequivocally that whatever you're doing, it's to, to mitigate their use, it's not working because it's in it's, the bees are consuming it. That's how it's in the honey. Um, and as you saw, the large majority of the world's honeybees are being poisoned with neonics and probably a bunch of other pesticides. Um, so, yeah, um, you know, you can't spray the landscape thousands of hectares of land with a toxin or use it in any other way and expect it not to have all sorts of environmental repercussions. It's just ridiculous. Yeah. Can the I, other Jay, issue I, I'm sure you hear a lot about, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to add one yeah. thing as someone who works with farmers that it's all very good to talk about these restrictions, but there's never any enforcement. And I can tell you that most of the farmers don't do it. And that's one of the reasons why um, all the residues studies show um, that these systems don't work. They're just systems on paper so the regulators can pretend they're doing something. But no one is out in the ground there. Who's out from the EPA or any state department to make sure that these are being enforced and people are, aren't spraying on, on, on these days? Yeah. And I can tell you also, as an organic farmer, you know, trying to stop these sprays going on our farm, all of us around the world have nothing but trouble to keep our neighbours' sprays off our farms. The regulators won't do anything. They're corrupt. Yeah. You know, in the context of what you've both been talking about in terms of, you know, the importance of enhancing biodiversity, you know, as a goal and why you've laid out the case for why that's so important. The issue you're raising, Andre, was brought up by a participant who feels this tremendous <clears throat> frustration when she's told that, well, you need to cultivate a biodiverse environment to manage your white flies, for instance, when she is experiencing drift from neighboring farms. Um, have you, are there any examples that you can point to that successfully has addressed drift as a, you know, a regulatory a tool to manage drift or restrict drift? Because we don't see it here in the U.S. It's, we talk about buffer zones that are arbitrary. These chemicals travel miles, of course. Exactly. What is your experience in terms of impacts on uh, biodiversity? Well, yeah. The drift is, is a big issue. The regulators won't, won't touch it. Look, the issue of dicamba in the States at the moment is, 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 is a classic. And, you know, nothing is being done and farmers are losing their crops. The, but for all of us, um, the only one that I know that, 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 that works with drift is what I call good neighbour policy. And... When neighbor, good neighbor policy doesn't work, nasty lawyer policy seems to work very well. A letter <laughs> from your lawyer um, and letting them know that you're serious here and you will take them to court. The, and that's worked for me. And But getting the regulators to do something 
is like getting blood out of stone. Yeah. Um, do you find this to be an issue, David, when you have uh, the chance to talk to policymakers? Or? Uh, the, the, the issue is usually raised by, you know, individuals, uh, members of the public who are suffering from drift. Uh, politicians, policymakers, mostly completely oblivious or couldn't couldn't give a stuff. Um, the the one, one extra thing you, I could suggest for someone if they're desperate and everything else has failed, it depends where you are and what vegetation, soil and everything else uh, you have. But a dense, tall hedge is better than nothing as a barrier to drift. It does absorb a lot of spray drift. It won't get rid of all of it. But if you've got the space to surround your land with a with a dense hedge, it's, it'll it'll be better than nothing. Yeah, yeah, I, I fully agree with that. That's exactly what I've done in my case. Um, it's tall bamboos. The bamboos are 30, 40 feet tall um, because my neighbours are sugarcane growers. So having a hmm. a hedge uh, that that is immune to their uh, it's related to their crop, so it's immune to their herbicide, so the drift doesn't kill it is really important. The other one which uh, is really important is having ones with very small leaves and leaf areas to catch the droplets and having it open so it, the, the wind that just doesn't go over it like a wall. It can actually go through it, slow it down, and when, when you slow it down, the drop start, droplets start to fall and you have these small little leaf areas to trap them, and that will make a huge difference. Not a hundred percent, but a massive difference. Yeah. So, Dave, this is for thank you. This is for you, and I think you touched on this: the study of flowering ornamental tree saplings, prophylactically pretreated uh, before sale, uh, with systemic pesticides. Um, your study uh, found that the that the poisoning or the contamination of these plants coming through the big the store the nurseries etc big box garden centers um is just pervasive is that is there anything more you wanted to say on that uh there haven't been many studies ours is one of rather few we only looked at herbaceous flowers and uh something like 98 percent had at least one pesticide some had as many as 10 pesticides in them i'd be really surprised if shrubs and trees on sale in those same garden centres weren't also reared in the same way. Um, but nobody's actually tested them. Um, I do know that that it's very common practice in forestry in, in, in Europe to, and probably all over the world, to uh, drench um, little saplings in near nicotinoids before planting them and that will make them it protects them for several years against insect pests which demonstrates how persistent they are um so yeah uh, unfortunately um i i suspect that that sat, you know young trees on sale are unlikely to be free of pesticides most of the time so in terms of advice to people that want to do the right things they want to Establish habitat. Um, they want their garden to look like the Lester Garden. Um, they want to create pathways for pollinator pathways, you know, to enable um, their community to support pollinators. Um, what's the first thing that they should do before? In, in, and I've I've been on farms where they, in the middle of a a field that's planted with treated seeds, they and spraying pesticides, they plant uh, flowers and habitat for, um, I asked the farmer whether he thought that was a killing field for pollinators and he, that wasn't the right question. But um, <laughs> but what what do you advise people, communities that, that are now engaged in trying to protect bees, trying to protect pollinators and everywhere they turn they're you know, they're coming up against this contamination of, of the seedlings or the seeds, et cetera. Uh, so, I mean, it's not it's not as 
bad as all that. Um, you, I don't know whether there are any organic nurseries in the US. There are some in the UK, and they they'll do mail order, so you can buy plants through the post from organic nurseries, and some of those do trees as well. Um, uh, growing from seed for smaller plants is is generally fine. Um, seeds on sale, sort of garden flower seeds, are not normally coated with insecticides in the way that uh, farmer's seeds might be. Um, uh, so by the time your seedling has grown into a, a plant, it'll it'll be fine. Um, and also, you know, the, the, there are really sustainable ways of getting hold of plants, do, doing plant swaps, you know, if, look over your garden, the fence at what they're growing next door. And most gardeners are happy to give away cuttings or offshoots or whatever uh, of their of their plants. And that's, you know, a, a properly sustainable, pesticide-free, hopefully, way of, of, of yeah. getting more plant material. Um, and we do have a directory on the Beyond Pesticides site, organic nurseries and seeds uh it's it is really critical it's just another thing that people need to be aware of might not have thought about it as they you know are attracted as you say they they become concerned about pollinators and bees what about in agriculture andre do you do you find that the seed issue is is a difficult nut to crack uh for for farmers yeah it it's one of our perpetual difficulties in the organic sector trying to get a reliable supply of organic seeds and in fact even here in Taiwan at this event um, is one of the major issues that, that came up and it's an area where we, we need more resources to get viable organic seed producers yeah but the other one I just want to say too is that um, what we really need to do is get go back to the way things always were and get farmers to save their own seeds and save the best seeds and develop um, their varieties that way. That, that's one of the things that I, I do on my farm. And that way you, you, you actually get into a, um, a culture of continuous improvement and build better varieties by doing it and moving away from this whole uh, farmer dependence on a handful of um, seed monopolies, which happen to be the same um, companies that sell all the pesticides. Yeah. yeah well, if I could we, just add what, yeah. one issue I've come across in North America and to some extent in Europe before the Neonic ban is that often farmers simply couldn't buy untreated seed. The whole... Yeah supply was was pre-treated before they had any option and on rare occasions where they could get a hold of untreated seed they were actually more expensive than the treated seed which is uh, kind of weird yeah and we're not only talking about insecticides like neonics we're we're talking about fungicides right that are that are treated um that treat the seeds you know this wouldn't be a beyond pesticide meetings without a question a meeting without a question about mosquito management and of course, we've seen in the United States the mosquito abatement districts spraying and huge bee kills um, that have attracted public attention. Um, have you had any success, uh, Dave, in sort of intersecting with mosquito management programs from the perspective of protecting biodiversity? Thankfully, this is not an issue that, that we suffer from, particularly in, in the UK. So it's not, not an area I know I have direct experience with. We don't have any problems with mosquitoes serious enough to warrant aerial bombardment. But I do know that, that the evidence is that generally it doesn't work, spraying insecticides over whole towns or whatever. Um, uh, is very ineffective. It will kill billions of organisms, but not many of the mosquitoes um i think what i do know and uh, andre may have other suggestions but uh trying to remove the breeding sites is is likely to be much more effective you know mosquito it depends on the species of mosquito but mostly they're breeding blocked gutters uh buckets full of water small pockets of water in plastic waste and that kind of thing um and getting rid of that is 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 a you know is a much more um sustainable way to tackle the problem 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, that makes that makes sense. Um, we, you know, we have sort of faced the question of how and what we do through our economic system to incentivize different practices. And I'm wondering, both you guys, through your travels around the world, do you see different governments and economic systems um, incentivizing more or less dependency on pesticides? Um, you know, we've had, we have a comment in, in the questions today that points to underlying incentives and, you know, the profit motive uh, to sell regardless of efficacy. You've mentioned efficacy several times, both both of you guys um, in your talks. Um, and yet we see this continual bombardment of uh, influence either through land grant in the US land grant institutions, university, universities that support, get support, uh, research support from the major seed and chemical companies and we see a lot of influence uh, through the market, despite everything you've been saying about lack of efficacy and the viability of alternative uh, management practices not reliant on these things. Do you see any bright spots around the world? Or There are, there are some good things happening. Uh, I mean, in Europe, um, the, in the European Union, the, the, there's this a new farm to fork strategy, which is aiming to and broadly to halve pesticide use, whatever that means exactly. And that's quite a slippery thing. Do you mean weight? Do you mean number of sprays or whatever? Um, but there there are fairly ambitious targets being set. Whether they will actually succeed is another question because there is this issue with the, this hugely powerful lobby that's pushing in the opposite direction, um, doing everything they can to derail that that strategy. Um, the UK, of course, has, has left the EU and we seem to be heading quickly to become the, the kind of dirty man of Europe. We're undoing neonicotinoid bans and, and generally making things awful here, I'm afraid. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, Europe is probably the leader at the moment, I would think, aside from a few tiny places like Bhutan who are, um, use right. far fewer pesticides. Yeah, yeah. Um, we did have a question about regulatory capture in the in the UK versus uh, the the uh, European Union after Brexit, and whether you've seen any change there, and whether there is to what degree there is regulatory capture, as it were, you know that. In that uh, it's really hard to know, isn't it? I mean, we all suspect yeah. all sorts of things. I, 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 you said that uh, that uh, you know you have. Um, political issues in the United States, or well, you're not alone, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, we have a pretty awful bunch of in charge at the moment. And they, I mean, we've, you know, they've just given licenses for a huge number of new oil and gas fields to be opened, which seems to rather miss the whole issue of climate change. Um, they're, they're not in any way sensitive to environmental issues at all. Profit seems to be all that really matters, I'm afraid. But exactly how it works behind the scenes, it's, you know, it's really fascinating but depressing um I, I i heard an interesting point made the other day which is that the industries that do most environmental harm are the ones with the biggest incentive to invest in politics and influencing politics because they're the ones that if our government was doing its job properly would be regulated out of business the fossil fuel companies the pesticide companies the mining companies and so on um but they may damn sure they're not by you know one way or another um capturing the decision making process of our government so it's it's so infuriating and i don't think any any of us really know how to combat that yeah you know for us here in the us the bright spot um which i i've already alluded to is local governments that are influenced by science and facts and can hear a conversation around what is needed to meet community goals. And of course, this is not agriculture related, it's related to parks management and playing fields and schools where local elected officials will stand up and say, well, if we don't need these toxics with all the controversy, 
then why would we use them? Which is obviously a, you know, a very simple but um, dramatic position to take in the larger scheme of things when we're talking national and state policy. Um, I, I guess I'm wondering, given all that you've studied, both of you guys through your lifetime and careers, um, you know, what what is the tipping point here for us as advocates? What are the best arguments we can bring and where, you know, where can we exert influence if that profit motive is so severe um, that we, you know, we don't have a hope of, you know, just mandating that we shift to what would be logical, which is um, an ecosystem-based approach to land management across the board. Do you see, you know, you, you've you mentioned, um, you know, you both have talked about the impact on our futures uh, with biodiversity collapse. The UN has elevated this as, you know, um, a crisis situation. Um, where in your travels, where do you see weaknesses um, of those that hold the reins of power where people can break through? Is that a fair question? Uh, I. I'm not sure I, yeah, well, I'll let me have a go at answering it. I'm not sure. I, it was quite a long question in the end. Yeah. That, I mean, I think it comes down to mobilizing enough of us somehow to, to make it mainstreamed. To, you know, the, it's difficult because we are often trapped in a kind of bubble of like-minded people preaching to the converted. You know, I give lots of talks. I write books. I make YouTube videos. And all of that is to try and spread the, the word to as many people as possible. But usually the people that listen to me or buy one of my books already kind of agree with most of what I'm saying. And I suspect they're a tiny minority of, of, of the actual population. And most people do not yet realize that the environment is important, that their children will suffer if we don't look after it. Um, and, you know, they're not bad people. They just don't. They're too busy doing other things at the moment. And somehow we need to get their attention. Um, and there are a few, it's obviously getting better. The, the, there are far more people aware of environmental issues now, particularly climate change, than there ever were. And there are, and there's actually Germany provides a bit of a, an, an example of how things can change. The, I, I mentioned the 75%, 76% decline in insect biomass in, in Germany study. That sparked uh, lots of media coverage and Bavaria, someone launched a petition demanding that the government do something. Um, and and more than a million people came out. They, it wasn't an online petition. It was a stand in the street until you get to the front of the queue and write your name petition. And more than a million people came out to, to sign it, which meant the, under the German uh, government system, the government had to act because more than 10% of the population had signed a petition. Um, and it has triggered a whole swathe of this, they've set ambitious targets for more organic farming, more habitat for pollinators, a whole bunch of things being done for insects, uh, which has spread from Bavaria to, to the rest of Germany. And that was with a, a very right wing government who were initially not at all receptive but who had no choice because so many people wanted it. And that's where we need to get to for the rest yeah. of the world. And, you know, it's, well, that's, it's, that's it's, the answer I've been really... searching for. That's the, that's the element of hope there that's based on real action. Um, and along those lines, have either of you um, uh, found any particular business leaders or, you know, we often refer to these types of people as influencers starting to get the message and then reaching out to you and, you know, elevating your voice. Any of that happening yet? There are some. Uh, uh, the, the main, you know, the big business leaders, you know, um, are, are mostly doing the opposite. If you want to talk about someone yeah. like Bill Gates as the yes. largest landowner in the US and he's the one who's pushing um, GMO foods, fake meats and 
and uh, pesticides and also pushing this around the world in, in, in Africa, for instance, um, causing famines in Africa with the failure of his systems. But what I really wanted to say where the hope is, and I'm the person who's on the front line here, and like I say, I'm on every continent, and we, we, we have members in over 70 countries, and where the change is happening is from the farmers themselves. And, Jay, you talked about, the, you know, the, you said how the profit is so big for the corporations, and it is. They are making trillions. Where does that come from? By impoverishing farmers and small communities. In most of the world, farmers are the lowest socioeconomic group. They are the oldest. No young child wants, or so very few children want to go into farming now because, and, and a lot of parents won't encourage them because, you know, they can make more money being a taxi driver or something than, than as a farmer. So farmers know something is very, very wrong. And this yeah. is why they like this concept of re regeneration. And what I've found now is that, you know, we, I get invited to speak at these farm meetings. And if, it, if I came as the, the international president of the organic sector, you might get 20 or 30 people. We're finding that people, they have to now book new venues. We're getting hundreds and hundreds of farmers who know they want to change. They know that they need to get off the pesticide and chemical treadmill. They just don't know how to do it. And what we're doing is giving them hope and making it accessible. We're not putting up barriers. One of the big problems we did in the organic sector, when you put in a three-year conversion, you killed it. What we're yeah. trying to do is not demonize them, but actually help them on this path of getting off pesticides and giving them the viable alternatives and really importantly, Getting rid of this mythology, you get off pesticides, your yield's going to fall down, you're going to get low yield, and showing them that we can reduce their costs, we can increase their yields, so in the end you've got more profit and you're more viable. These and the, the Rodale 40-year study has has actually shown that, and, and yep. the data is there. Before I ask you for any closing comments, uh, we did have a question, since we have focused so much on agriculture, um, Although, David, thank you for bringing up gardens and, and the urban context here. Um, are, the, are the regenerative principles that you guys are talking about in Regeneration International applicable to, do you see them as being applicable to land areas, say local parks and school districts and, yeah. and, and rolling that out? Is that something on the agenda? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Hundred percent. I think we're <laughs> both both keen to to say, yeah. I mean, there's absolutely no reason why not. In fact, more reason because so many people live in urban areas. There's there's more to be gained um, by removing pesticides. And in, in urban, I mean, the the crazy thing is in urban areas, there's just not really any need for pesticides in the first place. You know, the, the, there's we're not growing vitally important crops in most of our gardens. We're, we're just growing flowers um, and perhaps some vegetables and so on. Um, if the yield is down a tiny bit, worst case scenario, it really doesn't matter for for people in the developed world. Um, why, you know, as I said, you know, towards the end of my talk, why on earth would we want to spray poison around in our parks where our kids kick a ball around or whatever? And all the, the same principles that apply, you know, you don't, you, you can control pests in a, in a garden. It's easier than in a farm because it's, it's smaller scale. There tends to be lots of biodiversity anyway. Um, so yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. And I imagine the same thing applies to golf. People raise that question a lot. And I, I, I w I've been negligent by not bringing up golf with an Englishman because, you know, the game is such a different game uh the, uh there than in scotland and you know in great britain than it is in the u.s it's it's sort of akin to the plastic lawn uh versus the uh the challenging game of golf with a rough that uh or fairways that where the speed of the ball is not the big issue but the challenge of the game is the issue so um that's a conversation for another day but 
people in our community uh, find golf courses use, you know, a, a disproportionate amount of pesticides and, and fi find that to be a challenge. So any closing thoughts, you guys? Um, you've been very generous with your time and we, again, deeply appreciate uh, your work and your commitment, your passion to solving these problems. And uh, I know we'll, uh, we'll be distributing this session uh, by video as well. So we'll get the word out and, and give people an opportunity to, to tap into your, your knowledge and your inspiration. If I could just say one final thing from me, a point that hasn't quite come up, that there's this sort of popular myth promoted by the, the industrial farming lobby that we couldn't feed the world with organic food. Uh, and it misses the fact that actually uh, w there's tons of food in the world. There's there's probably three times as much food as we need to actually feed everybody, but, it, but a, a, roughly a third of it gets wasted. And about a third of it gets fed to animals in hideously crowded, cruel conditions. Um, which is just a, apart from in the, the the welfare issues is a really inefficient way of feeding people. So uh, I mean, there's a lot more I could say on yield yeah. and organic farming and so on. But but basically, it, it's a non non argument. It, it doesn't hold water at all, and we all need to be aware of that because it pops up all the time. All the time, and I know, and Andre, you've written about this and spoken yeah. on this this topic. Um, yeah. So thank you guys uh, again. Um, keep up your incredibly important work. And uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge and your inspiration. Pleasure. It's a pleasure. Bye-bye. Ciao.